They got the records mixed up. They must have got the results mixed up. So this is where you're going to start seeing other doctors. Okay. I'm going to go for a second opinion. Okay. Now I'm going to go for a third opinion. And I'm going to go for the fourth opinion. <coughs> okay. But this denial, it, and it, it all depends on the individual. It may be a short phase. It may be a long phase. Okay. Each of us are going to go through these different phases in different durations. So this is what denial is. Anger is the next step. Anger is the next step. This is where you demonstrate rage, envy, and resentment to anyone, including your loved ones. This is where you start pushing people away and when you start separating yourself from the rest of society. This is where it begins. I'm going to start pushing you away. I'm going to be angry at anyone and anything. Okay. Bargaining. Bargaining occurs when you start making a deal. You start bargaining. Who do people start bargaining with, generally? God. God. If you're spiritual, you start bargaining with God. God, you know what? Okay, I understand I'm going through this. Okay? I'm not quite accepting it yet because I'm kind of like in the cusp. But let's, let's make a deal, God. If you let me, just give me a couple weeks to, to, to live so at least I can see my, my son's graduation, my daughter's wedding, I can see my first grandkids, or I want to take that major trip to Europe, just, just, give me, you know, just give me a couple more weeks or a couple more months. This is where bargaining occurs. It's if you do this for me, I will do this for you in return. Okay? How many times have you, I mean, you see this in movies, God, do this for me, and I will be a better person. Okay? They start bargaining. This is where it happens. Depression is the next stage. With depression, now the individual has completely made themselves withdrawn from this, the, the, their surroundings. They had a, you know, in the beginning, they had a lot of friends. A lot of acquaintances. During depression, those friends and acquaintances has dwelled them down to a select few. So you still have those that are here trying to give love and support to this individual that's having to deal with this. Now, I also want to uh, keep this in mind, guys. When the, this person is going through the stages, is it just that person who is being affected by this? Who else is affected by the stages? Family. Family, family members. You are going through it with them as well. <coughs> okay. So as someone's going to depression, you also have family members that may be also going through this, and it's just hard for them, and trying to be supportive and also be uplifting and give them the emotional support that they need, which can also be draining to those family members. Okay. So, <clears throat> response to overwhelming number of losses. You feel abandoned as friends visit less and less to sever ties. This is where you need a lot of support and reassurance and also encouragement. All right, so finally, you have acceptance. Acceptance occurs. You are almost void of any feelings because they have gone through so much. At this point, the individual is just completely drained. You're going to be sleeping a lot, okay? You're going to be sleeping a lot because this roller coaster ride has been physically <coughs> and emotional draining, okay? Around this time, they've even limited their visitors to a very, very select few, and these are the ones that's going to help them get through this particular moment uh, in time, okay? So they limit visitors to uh, those few people with whom they feel safe and comfortable. Most significant communication at this time is moments of silence. Need hope for comfort and dignity. Dignity is an important term here that we're going to talk about here in a moment. Need to know they won't be abandoned and that they will be kept comfortable. Family needs as much support as patients, and if they have reached peace, oftentimes family may become closer than ever. Okay, so it has a tendency to bring family together. Not all the time, but most of the time. P 
patients and families can also get additional support from these different groups. You can get it through pastoral care. Okay? We have said in the past that the, what makes a patient, uh, I'm sorry, what makes an individual whole is mind, body, and spirit. So you have pastoral support. You may have patient to patient support. They have these support groups in which they uh, attend these meetings with other individuals going through the same thing, as well as psychological support groups. And then you have hospice and home care where the individuals, uh, again, we've, we've made the shift from a cure to making the patient more comfortable in their time here with us. <clears throat> hospice and home care. Is that also considered palliative care? It is palliative care. But we have two different settings. This is a formal setting with uh, your clinicians <coughs> in a, uh, again, a clinical environment. And then home care is where they come to you. To you. But they're both palliative. Okay. There's no, no longer a cure. You're just treating the symptoms. Okay. Influencing factors in death. How you perceive death. How you, how you deal with it. The age has a lot to do with this. Elderly patients may welcome death because it is a release from suffering, have had no time, have had time to complete the accomplishments and developmental tasks that most people take for granted. So when the elderly go, I don't feel as bad. It's like, yeah, they had a good life. Yeah, it's time for you to go. Right? Whereas if someone, if, if the life was taken away from someone who's young, your perception is a little bit different, isn't it? Right? It's like, man, they, they haven't even had a chance to go to the prom yet. I haven't seen my grandchildren. I haven't seen them get married. So it's a little bit different than someone who is uh, elder, elderly. Sexuality is a lifelong need. Remember we talked about Maslow's hierarchy. So anyone who's going through this grieving process, this is still a basic necessity. Okay, with aging functioning may be affected by changes in the reproductive system. I know it kind of gets technical here. But what it's saying here is that even as you get older, sex and intimacy is still an important part of the needs of man. So although there may not be any type of intercourse, there may not be any type of orgasm, the intimacy, holding hands, kissing, okay, hugging each other, is still <coughs> necessary. When you're going through the process, you have different concerns. Marital and family status, worried that they are unable to meet their role commitment as a spouse, parent, employee, and a friend. So they're not only thinking about the uh, pending death, but they're also thinking about, oh my gosh, how is my, my husband, how is my wife going to deal with this? How is my kids going to survive? Okay, that also falls under the social, socioeconomic factors. Cultural and religious <laughs> variations. Religion influences culture. Often culture and tradition are maintained and preserved through religious beliefs. Religion may determine reaction to illness, therapeutic interventions, and choice of medical uh, practitioner. Okay? Um, my mom, my dad. Okay, first of all, if you guys don't know what my background is, um, I'm Filipino. I'm an island boy. Okay? My mom and dad, if you know anything about Filipinos, we are very, very superstitious people. Okay? We believe in, in the gnomes. We believe in dwarfs. We believe in witches. We believe in the devil, the demon. We believe in angels. There's a lot of things that we believe in. Okay? Because the traditions have been handed down from generations to generations. My mom and dad, they're both medical. Okay? But they have they had problems separating tradition and medicine. So I would get sick, and I remember this growing up, I would get sick, and this is my mom, who was, who was an, uh, an RN, a nurse. So instead of giving me medicine, she would do rituals around me. She would get like grains of rice and sprinkle it around my head. I'm like, Mom, I, I just give me some medicine. I'll, I'll be a good. No, 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 son. I said, just give me some 7-Up. I probably just need a burp. No, we got to do this. 
okay? Cultural religions and how you deal with death, dying, and maybe sicknesses. Okay, I'm sure you guys all have your different traditions that you follow too, right? <coughs> yeah. All right. Physical condition, deformity, uh, deformity from amputation. Uh, let's see here, pain. Response to pain uh, can be determined by your culture. It can either be seen as uh, punishment, or it can be seen as something is trying, someone is trying to make you stronger. To show pain is a disgrace. Self-inflicted pain is a sign of mourning or grief. Tolerance to pain signifies strength and power. Self-image. Loss of your deformity of a body part, appearance due to illness, posture, eye contact, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what it's saying here. Okay, that's a little jumbled. Let's skip that for a moment. Okay, past life experiences. Uh, past life experiences influence behavior, <coughs> beliefs, attitudes about death and dying. We talked about that earlier. Your attitude, your influence, your upbringing can also determine how you deal with uh, these different types of situations. Do we have any questions so far? <coughs> okay, we've talked about this. I'm going to keep on going. Uh, prejudice, uh, ethnocentrism is a term that says that um, when you believe that your belief, your culture, is much better than the others. Okay, as uh, healthcare practitioners, we need to throw that out the window. Okay, because again, we're dealing with a very diverse population. Uh, okay. Let me get into uh, patients' rights related to death, dying, and treatment. What I'm going to be reading here is what's known as the Dying Person's Bill of Rights. Okay. This is our right as someone who um, will have an impending death. So as I read it, please listen carefully. Okay. So, um, I have the right to be treated as a living human being <coughs> until I die. I have the right to maintain a sense of hopefulness, however changing its focus may be. I have a right to be cared for by those who can maintain a sense of hopefulness, however changing this might be. I have the right to express my feelings and emotions about my approaching death in my own way. I have the right to participate in decisions concerning my care. I have the right to expect continuing medical and nursing attention even though cure goals must be changed to comfort goals. <coughs> I have the right not to die alone. I have the right to be free from pain. I have the right to have my questions answered honestly <coughs> and not to be deceived. I have the right to have help from and for my family in accepting my death. And I have the right to die in peace and dignity. I have the right to retain my individuality and not be judged for my decisions that may be contrary to the belief of others. I have the right to discuss and enlarge my religious and spiritual experiences, whatever this may mean to others. I have the right to expect that the sanctity of the human body will be respected after death. And I have the right to be cared for by caring, sensitive, knowledgeable people who will accept, I'm sorry, who will attempt to understand my needs and will be able to gain some satisfaction from helping me face my death. Now, as I read this, uh, I'm sure you probably had some experiences with some family and loved ones, and I'm sure that's who you thought about as I read this. There are some key terms here that have been an issue, uh, has been a main issue in the late, which is peace and dignity, dying with peace and dignity, and dying to retain their individuality. Okay. Do you guys know Brittany Maynard? Have you heard about her? Okay. She made headlines a couple of years ago. Well, a little background about Brittany Maynard. Soon after she was married, she was experiencing these headaches. Okay? These headaches got worse and worse and worse. And then she also began to have seizures, which also got worse. <coughs> she went to go see a doctor. And 
the doctor would return with some very grim news, which was she had a type of brain cancer that was not only aggressive, but very rare. In other words, there was no cure for it. Okay. So as this progressed, her headaches became so excruciating, very unbearable. And then she also had these episodes of seizures that would last minutes upon minutes. <coughs> okay. She was basically living, but not living. Do you understand what I mean by that? She was alive, but she wasn't living. She was living in a lot of pain. She was also reaching a point where she was starting to lose who she was as an individual. Now, what I mean about dying with dignity and knowing who you are became a very hot topic a couple of years ago because you want to go knowing who you are at that time, not when you're a vegetable, not when you're living in pain, because actually living in pain, is that worth it? These are things that you gotta think about. And I know there are some religious implications to this too, because to end your life is also considered a sin, okay? But that is why it was such a huge thing. So she had asked, and I don't like using the term uh, assisted suicide, but that's what it was. She had uh, gone to uh, the state of California seeking doctors, because she lived in California. <coughs> so she was seeking doctors to help her you know, end her life because she could no longer endure the pain that she was going through. Okay, so it went to the courts and the court said, no, you can't do that. You can't do that here in California, all right? So she ended up moving to Oregon where they had, um, where they had assisted suicide. So there was a documentary that was done on her. They followed her life. They, they tried to, um, they did a documentary on the, the implications of dying with dignity and what it means. Anyway, she, she moved to Oregon and she had selected the day that she was gonna take her life, which was on the day, uh, the day after her birthday. Uh, I, I forget what age she was. I think she was probably 26 or 27. Very young, okay? but. You know, she got her wishes and died the day after her birthday. Now, what's historical about this is, again, it used to be, uh, you know, a platform for discussion. But since she left, we they had more and more advocates. From, uh, uh, I would say, um, supporting what she did. Okay, because she's not the only person that went through. There are many families who have to deal with these things and having to watch their loved ones suffer. Um, anyways, they just passed this law in California at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. It just happened in California, January the 1st. So now it's, it's uh, they can do that here in California. But again, I'm not s s swaying on any side. I'm just letting you know that this is what they have to go through. But there's also other factors that are involved. And yes, there's some, again, <laughs> religious, cultural implications that also have to deal with this. <clears throat> so the Bill of Rights is against what some patients mm -hmm. they need to do, you know. It doesn't match what you just uh, read earlier, <coughs> the Bill of Rights. Uh, what, is, what do you mean? Um, there are a few things that you brought it up, the individuality, mm -hmm. and, you know, they want to be in comfort. It's against what some patients what they want. So right. So I mean, again, this this is just a general bill of rights. They they what they're saying here is, I I, I have the right. I'm the one that's dying. You can't tell me how I should die. It's my right. life. Right. So what what you're trying to say is, what you're seeing this as someone who's an outsider and challenging what their rights are. Uh, so again, this is my individual. I mean, this is the individuals. Bill of Rights and how they feel. Whether they follow it or not, it's not a law, it's not a rule. Okay, it's just an understanding. And one of those things is that, okay, as me as an individual, don't tell me who I can choose, who my doctors should be. Don't tell me what treatments I should have. Don't tell me that, you know, I should remain longer just so, you know, I can appease you by staying longer on earth. Because this also happens with you know people who are, who are in coma or, or, or brain dead. 
um, or vegetables. They're on life support because you're not you're not doing it for the patient who's who's your family member who's lying on the bed. You're doing it for your own selfish reasons. And again, this is my own opinion. You're doing it for your own selfish reasons because you don't want to let go. Okay. Although my, my, my wife will be here, she's a vegetable, she's never gonna come back, even if they were to revive her and she wakes up. <coughs> what is her quality of life when they bring her back? Okay, no, 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 I wanna keep her because I feel a lot better if I knew she was alive. Do you understand where I'm going with this? So this is where the controversy <coughs> is, and I, again, I see both sides of it. And that's why it's been going back and forth for a very long time. But again, yeah, they just accepted in California in the beginning of the year. Now, it doesn't mean that just because it passed that there's not going to be any type of controversy. Of course, every time it happens, the law is always going to get challenged. That's how it is. Just because the law exists doesn't mean it's not going to be challenged. So as this continues, you will have more advocates of the other side saying, no, you shouldn't be assisting people to die. <coughs> Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that also is going to go back, go to the next slide that I'm going to be talking about. Okay, which is advanced uh, uh, healthcare directives. When you enter a facility, not only are you filling out a general consent form to allow the hospital to, do, to perform certain procedures on you, but what you're also signing here is what's known as an advanced directive. It is a general basic directive that says if for some reason I'm unable to make decisions on my own, I am going to assign somebody to make those decisions for me. Okay, so this is what it is. This is what this advanced directive is. So the first one here is a living will. A living will is a document that lists the patient's wishes if they are terminally ill. Now we all heard about Prince, right? Remember the big thing after Prince died? He had millions and millions and millions of dollars in assets and property. And they didn't know who, who, who they, would, they would go to because he didn't have a, a will. Okay? I'm looking at the bigger <coughs> picture of this is that, okay, we'll just give the property to anybody. But what happens here is if you don't have a living will, families that you thought were tight and close-knit start to argue and bicker about who should get what and actually separates families, which is, to me, a little bit crazy because now it's, it's all about possessions rather than family. But that's what happened. This is what happens when you have, you see it all, you hear about it all the time when you have these superstars, they're dying, million millionaires, and they have these properties and assets they have nowhere to go, and you have family members fighting for it and it becomes very bitter. Now, if it was just written out, there would be no questions. <clears throat> it is listed, it is in black and white, and there's not going to be any type of argument, but this is what a living will is, okay? So if you guys haven't done it yet, I would highly consider doing it now, because you never know. Life is short. They always say life is short. You never know what's going to happen. <clears throat> Durable power of attorney for health care. This designates a person who will make healthcare decisions for a patient if he or she is unable to do so. <clears throat> what I want to focus on here are the advanced directives, <coughs> specifically titled DNR and DNI. DNR stands for do not resuscitate, which means that somebody's going on a full <coughs> code. You guys know what full code is, right? full respiratory and cardiac arrest, there are going to be explicit instructions there in the chart that will say, if I code, do not resuscitate me. Let me go. Let me go. I want to die. Okay? With that said, you have to follow their wishes. Okay? I'm just going to give you one example. This actually happened to me several times. So one in particular happened to me a, a couple, uh, about a year and a half ago. We had a patient um, who was in the ICU. She was scheduled for a, um, a heart catheterization, a heart cath, okay, to look at her heart vessels. So she was scheduled in the beginning of the day. 
but we didn't bring her down because she was unstable. Her blood pressure would go up and down, and her pressures, heart pressure would go up and down. So she was very unstable. We had scheduled her, so not in, in the beginning of the day, but we said, okay, we'll wait for her to get stable, and we'll do her towards the, the latter part of the day. Let her body rest, and we'll get her at the end of the day. Anyway, the end of the day came. <coughs> we brought her into our, our department, and from her room to our department, she had her entire clan with her. I mean, it was, it was um, her, their, uh, her kids, their grandkids, uh, uh, immediate family members. I mean, there was a good 20 to 25 people that were there. For, I mean, you can tell she was well loved. Okay, so as we made our way down to the hallway, we we put the family members in the waiting room. We took her to the exam room, and we were just having a conversation. We were all just having a conversation with her. You know, how are you? How is your family? You know, just basic conversation. And she was alive. She was alert, communicating. We began the procedure. It was not more than five minutes into it that we noticed that her vitals started to change. Her blood pressure dropped. She started going to V fibrillation. And as we're talking to her, I'm talking to her, her eyes rolled back. And we're looking at the monitor and we're like, shit, okay? So I wasn't scrubbed in, I was actually circulating. Okay, so you had the doctor and a uh, scrub tech with them and I was circulating and operating the x-ray equipment. So I lowered her drape immediately put the table down and started doing chest compressions, okay? And as I'm doing chest compressions, the nurse comes out of the control room, okay, another room. She says, she's DNR, she's DNR. And the doctor's like, stop, stop, stop. And I was like, okay, okay. So as that happened, the doctor was flipping <coughs> through the chart and then sure enough, it was verified that she was DNR. Do not res resuscitate. So what did we do? Let her go. We had to let her go. So as much as I wanted to go in there and do some chest compressions and help her, we had to follow her wishes. Okay? So all of us surrounded her uh, on the procedural table. You had a nurse caressing her forehead. I was caressing her, her knee. Um, and then you had another nurse that was just whispering to her that everything's going to be okay. Everything will be fine. Everything will be fine. <laughs> and so we, set, we literally just stood beside her and watched her die for about 20 minutes until she was gone. So, you know, although this is, this is what we deal with with clinicians, and I see this, you know, not a lot, but I see enough of it. This actually affected me because I remember going down the hallway and seeing her family. I, I saw her support and loved ones there, okay? And I also remember having a conversation with her, which made it very difficult for me because, I mean, I was sworn to help people. And I couldn't do it in this instance because we had to follow her wishes, all right? And then what made it more difficult is that, you know, when somebody dies in your in your procedural room, you gotta leave everything the way it is. So if she has, if they have tubes, lines, um, anything, you have to leave it the way it is. Okay. So the coroners can do an autopsy and do their own investigation of how how the patient died. In either case, we still had to put her in a body bag. Okay. So we cleaned her up. We put her in a body bag. We cleaned her up as best as possible, and we zipped it up so only her face was showing and then we brought the family members in, okay? And that was the thing that stuck in my head was the family members where they were just screaming and yelling and you can tell that they were very, very, I mean, it was their, their grandmother, their mom laying there on the table and it was tough for us to participate in that procedure. Um, but this is part of our job, this is DNR. Anyways, um, we still had one more procedure to do uh, which we were obligated to do, but another team from the other procedural room they said, you know what, you guys, you know, we'll handle this. All right. <coughs> so the, our team was able to just kind of, you know, step away from the environment and deal with it. Because like I said, we, we see this all the time, but there are just certain people, certain instances where it just kind of hits you hard. And I've had several of those in my career, but that was one, again, she was elderly. 
And it's like one of those, you know, you say, oh, she, she was old. She had a good life anyways. Not in this case. I wasn't feeling that. So we, we took it pretty hard. But that's what a DNR is. And I've had against several of these. Okay? So if it says DNR, you got to stop what you're doing. Okay? And just let them go. A DNI. Okay? A DNI is a little bit it's similar but different. When somebody's going to full code and you resuscitate them, however, they are not breathing on their own. They're not breathing <laughs> on their own. You cannot intubate them. Okay, you can resuscitate them, bring their heart heartbeat back, but if they're not breathing on their own, there's nothing you can do about that. Okay, so they may come back or they may not. Okay. So again, you've got to honor their wishes. You can resuscitate me, but if you're going to have to put a tube in me, I don't want it. And it could be that tube that's a matter of them surviving or dying. you got to, again, honor their wishes. 